I was doing my Sunday night drives for extra money with DoorDash and Uber Eats. My friends showed me how to use both at the same time and make more money per hour. One of the biggest issues with doing delivery services is that you have a lot of downtime where you just drive around waiting for an order to pop up. But if you work both apps at the same time, you can get rid of all that downtime and constantly be making money. So I was doing this for a few hours, racing back and forth between houses and restaurants, when I got a small order from a nearby restaurant, but the house was far away. These are the worst kinds of orders because you drive far and get paid less, though this one offered a large amount, meaning the tip must be crazy big. Accepting it, I picked up the order and began the 25 minutes drive to their address. Halfway through the drive, while on a side road, I got a call from the app. Assumingly being the customer, I answered, asking if this was my Uber Eats customer. A man confirmed he was my customer and apologized profusely, saying he ordered from his friend's account and forgot to change the address. He said his house was just around the block, though, and he proceeded to give me directions, telling me a couple turns to take. Once I reached the friend's house, I asked him for the address just in case I got lost, but he responded, saying I'll see him outside waiting for him, then hung up. Obviously, this shit was not normal. However, I was more than halfway there at this point, and I gave the man the benefit of the doubt, as forgetting to switch it from your friend's address seemed like a legit thing that could happen. It could have also been the fact that I was a bigger guy that helped me convince myself to go through with the delivery, as I wasn't really afraid of anything. When I got to the supposed friend's house, I took the turns, as the man had said, and drove down a dimly lit neighborhood road until I reached a no outlet sign and saw the road ended just a few houses down. Feeling confident I had taken the turns, as the man had said, I pulled over and grabbed my phone to call the customer. Just as I was clicking into my recent calls, a knock at my driver window made me jump. A bit embarrassed at how noticeably startled I was, I rolled the window down to greet him, but looking up at the man, his face had no emotion just a completely straight, blank face. I let go of the window button and immediately pressed the lock button, which was followed by the man sticking a gun through the half-open window right at my head. As he yelled out something, I heard more voices call back, followed by a group of people running up to the car and trying to open the door handles. They were all yelling commands at each other, but in the heat of the moment, I couldn't make out what they were saying. I was in a full-on shock, staring into the barrel of this guy's gun. If I had to guess, there were at least five or six people surrounding my car in this moment. I don't even remember having any thoughts. But I can only describe it as more of a reflex-type reaction, because when the man holding the gun looked away for a split second, I suddenly slammed on the gas flooring it down the street. I'm surprised the man even held onto his gun as he pulled his hand out of the window just in time. Seeing the end of the road, though, I quickly did a three-point turn, and when I faced the other end of the street again, they were all gone. Not a single one of them anywhere on the road, sidewalk, or by the houses. They must have just fled the scene the instant I began driving. As soon as I made it out of the neighborhood, I called 911. These gang-type attacks are relatively common around here, but I never thought it would happen to me. Although nothing came of it. With nobody being found and every piece of evidence leading to nowhere, I see this event as a sort of wake-up call for me. I realized in the moment that the man put a gun to my head, that being a big, confident man meant absolutely nothing. Taking a risk like that was purely stupid, because literally anyone with a weapon can have your life in their hands in an instant. If you work a job like this or do anything where you see strangers regularly, be careful because putting yourself in a risky situation with a stranger could be the last thing you ever do. Being a delivery driver for several pizza places a few years back, I had a lot of experiences with weird customers or just strange things that would happen at night. But this one night takes the prize for the most disturbing and unusual situation. I had been working at the specific chain pizza shop for just under a year. I worked mid-shifts and night shifts alongside one other coworker. For the most part, it would stay busy, basically up until closing at 2 am, so there wasn't a ton of time to mess around, especially since it was just the two of us. I'll call my coworker Tom to keep his privacy. Tom was older than me by a few years and was a quiet, 
hard worker. He was in charge during the night shifts and would make all the pizzas while I would deliver them. Both of us would answer calls, though, depending on who was busy and who wasn't. Anyway, it was just past 11 p.m. And I had gotten back from a delivery when the phone rang. Seeing Tom in the middle of making a pizza, I picked up the phone. A man on the other line spoke, asking for a large sausage pizza. I put in the order and asked if he needed anything else. The man didn't answer for a moment, then he repeated himself, saying that he'd like a large sausage pizza. This time, I could tell through the way he mumbled it out that he was likely drunk. I confirmed that he just wanted one pizza, and the man said yes. I sent the order through, then grabbed my next delivery and dropped it off. Getting back to the shop, Tom had finished the guy's order and prepped it for delivery, so I grabbed it off the counter, ran to my car. I noticed as I was grabbing the order though, Tom was giving me a weird look, as if he wanted to say something to me, but he decided not to. Again though, Tom was pretty quiet and soft-spoken, so it wasn't very odd. The address was a good 15 minutes away, but there was no traffic at this time, so I got there pretty early. The house was normal, but had a lot of land on either side, with the neighbors' homes barely visible through the trees. I got out and went around to the passenger door to pick up the pizza. Then I headed up to the porch and knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a man came and opened the door wide open. This wasn't all that strange, but I always found it odd when people would open their door that wide, as it was just unnecessary. But his face when he saw me seemed very confused and surprised, as if he hadn't expected to see me. Figuring he was just drunk and out of it, I handed him the box and told him his total, to which he slowly and awkwardly handed me cash. Not saying anything. He held the box of pizza while standing in front of me and looked at it with a strange intensity. Then he moved his eyes up towards me, but not at me. He was looking over my shoulder like he saw something, but was just staring at it with that same intensity before shaking his head slowly like he was saying no. Getting really uncomfortable watching this man, I couldn't help but look back. I turned my head over my right shoulder and looked toward the driveway. Just a few feet from my car was a hooded man running back towards the trees. My heart jumped and I felt my body go into a sort of shock. Trying to figure out what to do, I turned back around to face the man at the door, but he immediately stepped back and slammed the door shut. It all happened so fast in just a matter of seconds and gave me no time to react. With the door closed in front of me, I turned to face the hooded man again, but he was lost in the dark tree line. I stumbled off the porch and ran to my car, backing out of the driveway as soon as possible and driving back to work. I calmed myself during the drive but still couldn't understand what happened. When I got back, I told Tom about the encounter, who seemed to have very little reaction and rather just told me to deliver the next order when I was ready. I did as he said, but on my way back from the delivery I ended up pulling over and calling the police to let them know just in case. They said they would have an officer check it out and call me back to update me. I got a call an hour later and once I got out of work, I waited in the parking lot for the police to show up and talk to me. When the officer came up to my car, he mentioned that he talked to the man at the residence who matched the description I gave him and the guy told the officer that he was just waiting for his buddy Tom to show up since he knew he worked at the pizza shop. When asked about the hooded man, he gave no details, saying he didn't know anything about that and he didn't see anyone with that information. I was even more horrified and confused. I thought maybe they called thinking Tom was a delivery driver and were setting him up so that they could jump him. That would explain the hooded man by my car and the surprise of the guy at the door. I also think back to that look Tom gave me, thinking maybe he was going to warn me of something. I talked to Tom on multiple occasions about it though, but he gave me quick, useless answers, saying the guy was just an old friend and that he didn't know anything about anything. I moved on to another pizza shop very soon after that incident. But now that the horror of the situation is in the past, and I know it likely wasn't a target on me specifically, I enjoy trying to figure out the mystery. I still don't know for sure what the situation was, but it was by far the strangest and creepiest I've ever had. During COVID delivering groceries became pretty popular, and even after, people still had them delivered to their house. 
I was a picker for those orders, and when we were understaffed, which was pretty much all the time, I was also dropping them off. It wasn't a bad job. I actually enjoyed driving to people's homes. I got to see nice houses, and I didn't have to deal with the constant questions from customers, so I wasn't complaining. I got tips sometimes too, which was nice. Most of the time though, I left the groceries at the doorstep, took a picture as proof, and then left. But I did have moments where I got to meet the people and help them take in the groceries. One instance was this older lady from Serbia. Her name was Vesna, and she loved me. We got to know each other because every Thursday she'd have pretty much the same stuff ordered to her house at the exact same time. The first few times I dropped off her groceries, she never came outside, but I'd catch her peeking out the window at me. I'd give a little wave, take my picture, then get back in the truck and leave. I think once she realized it was the same person delivering her groceries every time she got more comfortable, she came out and greeted me. Then slowly, over time, I started bringing in the groceries for her and setting them on her counters. She was pretty old, so I was happy to help. And she also tipped nicely too. The more I went, the more I got to know her. She was recently widowed and lived alone. All her children lived far away, and she only saw them once or twice a year for the holidays when she could take the train. She was also retired, but she used to be a broker, which explained her nice house. I always looked forward to Thursdays, and this one was no different. She had ordered everything on Monday, as she always did, and I was dropping off the following Thursday. When I pulled into the driveway, I immediately noticed that something was off. She wasn't at the door like she usually was, but the door was open. I also noticed that all her blinds were closed, which was strange. She always kept them open so her plants could get some sun. I went up to the open front door and not seeing her, I rang the doorbell. I waited for a bit, but there was no answer. I knocked a few times and there was no answer again. So I naturally started to become a little worried. She was old, so my immediate thought was maybe she fell or had a heart attack or something. I kind of stood there wondering what I should do. I thought maybe I should go inside. But I was also on the job and I know the rules are that if no one answers, I just have to leave the groceries on the porch. Being her friend, though, I decided it best to go inside and at least put her groceries on the counter. Like usual. The door was open after all. I grabbed all the bags in both of my hands and walked straight into the kitchen. All the lights were off and everything was quiet. Placing the bags on her counter, I called out her name again, hearing no response as I started walking out. Calling the police crossed my mind, but I didn't really know how to explain this was an emergency because what if she was just out of the house? Maybe she was just visiting someone and I just wasted the police officer's time. I really was in a weird position. But I just knew something was wrong. But just as I got to the doorway leading outside, I heard movement in the house upstairs. I felt relieved for a moment calling out for Vesna, but then there was again no response. No one came to the door or answered me. After a minute of standing there, I kept hearing shuffling movement, as if someone was moving stuff around upstairs, and started to feel really awkward and uncomfortable. I headed back outside and got in the car. I sat there for a little while, and after a minute I saw the curtains on the second story move to the side, as if someone was looking at me through the window. I pulled out and drove around the corner, then parked on the street and sat there, just really confused. I didn't know if it was her and she just didn't want to see anyone or maybe one of her kids. I was also concerned with whether or not I should call the police. I drove off, went around the block and then decided to drive by her house again. I sat there for a little while again until I saw the upstairs curtains open. I saw a male figure look out and then closed it quickly, as if seeing my truck scared him. I knew Vesna had two daughters and she had a son, but he had passed away years ago, so I'm not sure who could possibly be at her house with her not there. And where would she be anyway? I had been there too long though, and had to get back to work the following week. There were no orders from her for the first time in almost a year. I drove by her house after I got off on Thursday, and in the driveway was an officer's car. When I got home, I searched her name and found that she had been filed as missing. 
only a few days after I had been there to deliver her groceries. I noticed the date they said she was likely last at home, though, was the day after she had ordered the groceries. Two days before, I had gone to her house and saw that man. I went to the police with all the information I had. I don't know who that man was or if I was close to having something happen to me as well. But it's been nearly three years now, and there have been no updates. It was about five years ago when I was out on a date with my wife, who at the time was my girlfriend. We had decided to spend our four-month anniversary on a cheap date that consisted of us having a picnic by our favorite lake, watching the sun go down and then staring at the stars for a few hours. It started out as one of the best nights of our lives, but sadly it turned into one of the scariest, at least in my opinion. Everything about the date was going perfectly. We were having a lot of fun. And even though the sun had gone down, the sky was so clear and bright, thanks to the size of the moon and all the stars. It was the sort of thing that you didn't want to end. But as the night went on, we both knew that we had to head back to our car and head home. So eventually that was what we did. We gathered all of our things and began walking along the dark trail, using only the moonlight to see what was ahead of us. We both made our way down the trail hand in hand, trying to both seem happy and calm, though I'm pretty sure that the two of us were both feeling a bit scared. I mean, once the magic of the night faded, we were both just walking through the woods in the middle of the night. Who wouldn't be a bit on edge? But neither of us wanted to show it, so we both just put on a brave face and continued talking as we walked back to the car. We had made a decent distance and honestly, I had sort of forgotten about the creepy situation that we were in and went back to enjoying myself. However, that was when Amy, my girlfriend, began to squeeze my hand tighter. When I asked her what was wrong, she said she felt like someone was watching us. I was trying to stay strong and began telling her that the odds of that were really slim and that we were fine. But when we looked around us, we both simultaneously realized that I was wrong. As we looked over to our left, we both froze as we noticed that a silhouette of a man that had been illuminated by the bits of scattered moonlight that were leaking through the treetop canopy around him. Amy screamed as she noticed him walking toward us, and I told her that she needed to run as fast as she could to the car and I would follow behind her. The both of us took off running, and I kept periodically looking back toward the man to see if he was following us. To my surprise, he made his way onto the trail and then just stopped in the center of it and stared in the direction that Amy and I had been running in. Thankfully, we both made it back to the car and quickly drove away from the head of the trail. The entire car ride home was full of panic and curiosity as to what that person was doing out there and why they were following us but didn't chase us. The two of us talked about what we should do and ultimately decided not to call the police at first because technically we didn't see anything illegal happening. For all we knew, it might have just been another hiker or something, and we just let the ambience scare us. Our opinion on the matter changed a few weeks later, however, when a body was discovered off the trail just a short distance away from where Amy and I had our picnic that night. The two of us decided that we needed to tell the police about what we saw that night and let them know about the person who was following us. It's still unclear if the two incidences were connected, but the more I think about it, the more I feel like we were almost witness to something that caused the man in the woods to follow us. Who knows what would have happened if we didn't notice him walking toward us that night. The day I stopped going camping on my own was the day that I almost lost my leg. It all started off as a great weekend. I had decided to go camping from Friday evening to Sunday afternoon and maybe do a bit of fishing. Both Friday night and Saturday morning went off without hitch. I set up camp and enjoyed a nice fire on Friday night, and then I went fishing early Saturday morning. I didn't have much luck on the water, but the weather was beautiful and the forest was alive around me with small critters and deer roaming around. Little did I realize it was also bear season. I returned from the river early Saturday afternoon and on the walk back I noticed what looked like an animal trail that I was interested in. My plan was to eat some lunch and then go for a nice hike to see what sort of animals I could see. 
Right away I could tell that there had been bears traveling that path throughout the season. There were scratch marks along with some tufts of fur left on some of the trees that I passed, but lucky for me, there were no signs of actual bears, just some cool sights to look at. Now one thing that most avid hikers will tell you, especially when you're walking around terrain that is relatively new to. You, you should always keep your eyes on the ground and watch your step. My mistake was that I was too curious about the bear markings on the tree and didn't notice what was resting on the ground right in front of me. I took a step forward with my right leg and my foot hit what I thought was the forest floor. I heard the sound of metal banging together and felt an excruciatingly sharp pain run through my leg. I screamed as I fell to the floor and looked toward my feet to see a large metal bear trap had locked itself around my ankle. I couldn't see through my pant leg, but I could be almost certain that my leg was broken and moving. It was far too painful. I looked around for anything that might help me out of this situation, but there was nothing nearby. I could feel my ankle getting warm as it throbbed with pain, so I tried to pry the trap off with my hands, but there was no way I could get the leverage to do so in my position. I was stuck, unable to move and with no one to call for. Help! Though time felt like it stopped around me. Daylight faded quickly. There was no chance of me sleeping through the night with the pain that my ankle was in, and slight movement was enough to make me shriek. Eventually the morning came and with the sounds of wildlife, I was terrified when I heard the sound of something walking in the distance. I probably wouldn't have even noticed it if it had not stepped on a branch or twig and broke it. But when I looked over I could see that there was clearly a medium-sized brown bear heading down the game trail toward my position. I don't think it knew what I was right away or if it even noticed me, but I was horrified. Thankfully, I didn't have to find out its agenda because the sound of a single gunshot scared the beast away and sent it running in the opposite direction. I looked in the direction of the gunshot and noticed an elderly man with a rifle in his hand making his way toward me as fast as he could without toppling over. As soon as he was next to me, he began apologizing. It turned out that I stumbled into a trap that he had set earlier that weekend. He helped me out of the trap and then gave me a ride to the hospital where they had to set my leg and give me a cast. The man was very apologetic about the entire thing, but I assured him that it wasn't his fault, it was an accident and I should have been paying more attention. I'm just glad that he showed up and got me out of the trap when he did. My entire life, I had been a fan of going on long hikes or camping trips. No matter what I was doing, I loved being around nature. That was why, when I had finally gotten my license and was able to travel long distances to go on some of the most amazing hikes you will ever experience, I didn't miss a beat. However, that all came to an end when I ended up needing to get my foot amputated from the ankle down. Honestly, the only thing I really miss doing that I can't do anymore is those long hikes, which, incidentally, was the cause of my injury in the first place. It all happened on a breezy summer day when my friend and I decided to go for a hike along a trail that we had read about that supposedly passed by various waterfalls and caves. The reason we had never gone before was that the trail was about three hour drive from our houses, but the weather was perfect and we had nothing to do that day, so it seemed like the perfect time to finally check it out. And at first, it was just as beautiful as you would imagine. The foliage was nice and blooming. The shade from the trees made the heat more bearable, especially with the nice breeze that was rolling through. And the birds were being loud and proud with their music. It was truly blissful. Which is probably why I wasn't paying much attention to where I was walking. It was about an hour and a half into the hike, and we had passed by a few of the falls that we had heard about and even spent some time cooling off in one of the small pools underneath one of them. And at the time, we were considering taking a small break and eating some lunch that we had packed for ourselves. But just as we had begun to make our way over to the small formation of rocks, we heard a terrifying rattling sound. The two of us froze in place as we recognized the sound of the rattlesnake, but even as we both were looking around at our feet, we couldn't find it. We both began talking to one another, trying to figure out how we should get away from the area as safe as possible without knowing where the snake was. And I swear, the entire time we were talking, it was as if the rattling noise was getting more and more aggressive. We continued to look around us but couldn't see any sign of the snake. 
and eventually we decided that we should walk back away from the rocks the exact way that we came toward them, and hopefully we would be fine. Sadly, we were mistaken. We couldn't see the snake because apparently I had stepped right over the top of it, and it was nestled right behind the back of my right foot. When I lifted my foot to begin stepping backward, I felt the sharp sting of the snake's fangs dig into the back of my exposed ankle. I screamed as I flicked my foot forward, throwing the snake to the side. My friend quickly grabbed me by the shoulders and ushered both of us in the opposite direction of the snake. But once we were away, we knew that we didn't have much time. As someone who enjoyed the outdoors, I was somewhat prepared for the situation, meaning that I knew what we were supposed to do until I could get help. I calmly told my friend to call the hospital and inform them of what happened and that I had been bitten by a rattlesnake. That way they could have the anti-venom handy when the ambulance met us at the head of the trail. Then what I thought I should do next was to cut off the blood flow from my ankle to my leg in order to slow and hopefully stop the spreading of the venom. I'm still unsure if that was the right thing to do or not, as some say that the tourniquet is why my foot ended up getting so bad in the first place. However, I was no expert. I simply cut off the flow of blood using the belt that I had been wearing. And then, after supporting me on his shoulder, my friend and I began hobbling back toward the entrance of the trail. We were moving very slowly by the time another group of hikers found us and thankfully they offered to help us out and carried me out of the forest. By the time I could see the first responders walking down the trail, I was elated. At that point, my foot felt as if someone was building a fire inside of it and it was burning from the inside out. It was so discolored that I could tell by the first responder's face that things weren't going to be good. Thankfully, they administered the anti-venom and my life was no longer in danger. However, the same couldn't be said for my foot back at the hospital, it was determined that the tissue damage to my right foot from the ankle down was too extensive and the best course of action would be amputation. It's been five five years since I lost my foot on what was supposed to be a peaceful hike through the forest. All I can say is that I'm glad to be alive, but I sure do miss those times being out amongst the trees. So the next time you find yourself out in the woods, make sure you are watching everywhere that you step. Growing up, me and my best friend James used to love going over to his grandmother's house for the weekend. The two of us loved to skateboard and right next to her house she had a really steep hill for us to bomb down. And on top of that, she lived right next door to a convenience store so that we could stock up on all the snacks we needed. And then after hours, when the store was closed, the two of us would often go and skate in the parking lot, using the curb and parking rails as obstacles to practice our tricks on and over. It really was a bunch of fun, except for the time that we had been stalked by these two guys in an old brown panel van. It all started earlier that day. It was a Saturday and the two of us were doing our thing, just skating around and trying to keep out of trouble, when we noticed this van that had been driving behind us. As we rode down the big hill that I mentioned, the two of us figured that we must have been in their way, so we slowed ourselves down and pulled off to the side of the road to give them room to pass but to our surprise, they stopped right behind us. We looked over at the two men and they were clearly staring at us, but they didn't say anything. So after a minute, the two of us just shrugged and began skating down the hill again. Thankfully, the van didn't pull out behind us, at least not at first. It wasn't until about five minutes later, when we had made it to the bottom of the hill and back to his grandmother's house, that we saw the van slowly drive by. James and I were confused, but we didn't really think anything of it. We spent the next few hours helping his grandpa cut and stack firewood while James's grandmother cooked dinner for all of us and we couldn't be certain, but we both swore that we saw the same van drive by at least three more times. It was really strange, but when all was said and done, we finished our work and ate some food before getting back out on our skateboards. Nightfall came and the deli next door to James's grandparents' house closed. As the two of us were skating outside, we said goodnight to the store owners and they told us to be safe before heading off in their car. 
the two of us continued to skate and listen to music for a few more hours before we both stopped as we noticed something in the distance. It was hard to notice because the headlights weren't on, but across the street and down the road a little bit. James and I could clearly see the van that had driven by multiple times before and it was almost like they knew we spotted them because as soon as we stopped skating, their headlights turned on. The van slowly began to make its way down the street toward the two of us and we didn't even have to say anything to each other. Before we both knew what we had to do, James and I quickly grabbed our backpacks and our boards and started sprinting through the grass behind the convenience store toward James's grandparents' house. We could hear the sound of the van speeding up before we heard what was certainly one of the doors opening and closing as one of the men hopped out of it and began chasing after us. James and I luckily made it through the yard and into the safety of his grandparents' home and locked the door behind us. James pulled his phone out of his pocket and quickly began dialing 911 as I looked out of the kitchen window toward the street where I saw the van and someone getting back into the passenger side. Once he was inside, the van quickly drove off, leaving skid marks on the street as they tore away. The police showed up and we explained to them and James's grandparents what happened to us and they said they would be on the lookout for a brown panel van. But as far as we know, the van wasn't found and neither were the two men who were following us around that afternoon. I used to love spending the night at my friend's house. I didn't have siblings, so it was a lot of fun to have someone to hang out with all day. However, I quickly stopped going to sleepovers after I went to my friend Ray's house. You see, Ray had this one neighbor that always seemed like he was staring at us from his house. And one night things got a little too creepy for my liking and I figured it's probably best I just sleep at home where I know I'm safe. It was toward the end of summer vacation between 5th and 6th grade and Ray had invited me over to spend the night. He had just gotten the new call of duty and we were going to play split screen all night. I got to Ray's relatively early in the afternoon that day, and after I had been dropped off and settled in, the two of us decided to go hang out in the yard for a bit while there was still a couple of hours of daylight. Whenever I would hang out over at Ray's, the two of us would always spend a lot of time either near the stream behind his house or jumping on the trampoline that he had set up in the backyard. We spent about an hour jumping that day before we noticed it. Ray was the one to point it out, but as soon as he did, I could clearly see his neighbor sitting on his porch and looking across the yard in our direction. We tried to ignore him for a while, but no matter how much we pretended that he wasn't there, it was like I could feel his eyes on us. They were unwavering, and aside from going inside, there was nothing that we could do to pry them away from us. Ray's dad had spoken to him a few times about looking over at his son, but because he was technically not doing anything wrong, there was really nothing to be done aside from putting a small fence around their yard and cameras outside their doors. So after a little while of trying to ignore his neighbor, Ray, and I decided the sun was going down anyway, so why not head inside and have some dinner? We went inside and let Ray's parents know about the neighbor, which sent them on a rant about how irritating it was that they had a neighbor like that. Ray and I finished our dinner as we planned the rest of the night and what game we would start off playing first. And as we previously discussed, it was time for a Call of Duty marathon. As we played, time began to fly by and before we knew it, Ray's parents had gone to bed. And when we looked at the clock, it read 11 p.m. This. As we played, time began to fly by and before we knew it, Ray's parents had gone to bed. And when we looked at the clock, it read 11 p.m. This was only the beginning of our night, though we planned on staying up the entire evening playing. Sadly, that all came to an end. While we were between games, we were in the lobby waiting for the matchmaking to cue us up in another game, and Ray looked up toward the clock, which happened to be positioned next to the window of their house. What he saw caused him to practically throw his controller and let out a loud shriek. He pointed to the window and began saying in a shaky voice that he had just seen his neighbor. Ray said that he was watching us through the window, but when I looked over, I didn't see anything. I quickly got up and pulled the curtains closed and then began looking around to see if any other windows had been left open. Ray said that he was going to get his parents, and I continued to look around the windows, though I'll admit I was walking really slowly. I was pretty on edge at this point, but what sent me over the top was when I made my way into the kitchen. As I walked into the kitchen, 
I stopped in my tracks as I heard the handle on the door shaking, as if someone was trying to open it. I could see the shadow of someone through the frosted glass window on the front door as they stood under the porch light, and I immediately ran back into the living room and yelled for Ray and his parents. Ray's dad came running through the house, and I yelled that they were at the door. He wasted no time getting there and unlocking it, but when he opened the door, no one was on the other side. Before he could close the door, though, Ray's mom came rushing down the hallway with her phone in her hand and tears running down her face. I could hear her telling Ray's father to call the police because they caught the entire incident on camera. When the police arrived, they were shocked to see clear video of Ray's neighbor walking onto his property and up to each window of the house until he found the one that he could watch us through. He apparently stood there watching us for about a half an hour before he appeared to be startled, assumingly by Ray catching him. He then quickly ran around the house and tried to break in before being scared off by the sound of Ray's father running through the house. The officers promptly made their way over to the neighbor's house and knocked on the door. The man pretended to have been sleeping, but the police didn't buy his story, especially not with the proof we had. Ray's neighbor was arrested for trespassing, among other charges. I'm sure I felt bad, but I was too afraid to stay the rest of the night, and Ray's parents ended up driving me home after the police finished up at their house. Now I only sleep at my own house, where I feel the safest. It was the summer of 2009 and we had about a week until school started back up and to celebrate, my mom and dad let me have a sleepover in the camper that we had in our backyard. I was able to have three friends over and we were going to have a small fire in the backyard and then go hang out and play board games in the camper while we listened to music over the speakers. It was a really fun idea and something I loved to do whenever my parents would let me. However, we ended up getting rid of the camper the following year and it's probably for the best. I don't think any of us would dare sleep out in our yard again after what happened that night. Everything had started out great, the fire was a bunch of fun and the mosquitoes were surprisingly not too bad that night, but the evening really started when we all loaded up in the camper and began hanging out without my parents. It was just the four of us and I had my dog Bugles with me. Bugles was a basset hound who was about four years old at the time and he was my best friend for sure. I know for a fact that all my friends and I were thankful that he was there with us that night. Once we were in the camper, we plugged my iPod Nano into the speakers and listened to some music as we played a couple of games of Settlers of Catan with each other and eventually all of us were tired and it was time to go to bed. Sleeping in the camper was great because we all had our own beds that were surprisingly comfortable to sleep in and we could keep the AC going all night once we all decided to lie down. Sleep came quickly. However, our dreams would end as quickly as they started once we had all been woken up by the sound of Bugles growling. I sat up in the bed and began looking around and I could see Bugles, who was just sitting in front of the door to the camper and growling as if there was something outside. I decided it was better to be safe, so I quietly got out of bed and made my way over to the camper door and made sure that we had locked it. And then I tried to usher Bugles away from the door, but he wouldn't listen to me at all. He was locked onto whatever was on the other side of the camper door. Chills began to run up my body as I looked around at my friends who had also woken up. They all looked just as concerned as I was, but my buddy Robbie, who was there that night, tried to calm us all down by saying it was most likely just an animal walking through the yard and bugles could smell it. That sounded like a good explanation to me, but I decided that I should peek out the window just to make sure that we were safe. I was feeling much better thinking that it was just an animal, so I didn't hesitate to crack the curtains and look out of the camper. But what I saw sent me flying backward. I couldn't quite catch my breath to tell my friend what I had just seen at first, and at that moment, Bugles went from growling to barking. He was now standing with his face practically pressed against the door, barking his head off. And when I could find the words, I looked up to my friends and let them know that someone was out there. When I looked out the window, I could see clear as day someone was standing right outside of the camper door. Thankfully, as Bugles continued to bark, we could all hear the sound of whoever it was running off. My friends and I decided that it would be best for us to stay in the camper until it was morning and just make sure the door stayed locked and shut. And that's exactly what we did. We all huddled together at the table and began playing some games again as we tried to keep calm. 
Thankfully, my dog stayed up all night with us and would not take his attention away from the door. The next morning, we went into the house and explained what happened to my parents, but you could tell that they thought it was just our imagination. All I know is that we never stayed in that camper again, and as I said, we ended up selling it shortly after that because we didn't use it anymore. Last year I was asked to watch my sister's kids while she went out of town for a few days. I'm a female and I'm in college, so I was home for the summer and obviously I said yes. My sister is 7 years older than I am and has twin boys who are now 5 but were 4 years old at the time. It was just going to be 3 or 4 days, but I was still really nervous to watch them all by myself because I figured not one, but two 4 year olds would be really challenging. At first it was, but I spent some time with them before my sister left, taking care of them a little bit so I could get used to it. Obviously I'd seen them many, many times before, but I never had to actually take care of them. When my sister left, I did have to call her a couple of times with small questions, but for the most part everything was going good. My sister and her husband have a two-story house with all of the bedrooms being upstairs, and I would be staying in one of them. The twins share a bedroom right next door to the master bedroom. Then there was a guest bedroom that I would be in most nights. I would try to have the twins in bed by like 8 or 9 p.m. On the second night, the twins seemed to have a lot of energy. They played with their toys and ran around the living room until it was time for bed. It took a little bit of effort, but I was finally able to get them both upstairs and in bed by about 9 o'clock. I went downstairs after that because I wasn't tired at all. I was hanging out in the living room when about an hour later, I started to hear noises coming from upstairs. I figured one of the twins, or both of them were awake and playing around in their bedroom. I went upstairs to tell them that they needed to go back to bed. When I got upstairs though, I went into the twins' bedroom to see them both fast asleep in their beds. This was confusing me. Were they playing a trick on me? I shut the door and started walking back downstairs, but then I heard more noises. Again, I stopped. The noises weren't coming from the twins' bedroom though. They were coming from the master bedroom. Who on earth could possibly be in there? I had a terrible feeling about it and didn't even think about opening the door. Instead, I ran back into the twins' bedroom and shut the door. Thank goodness they had a lock on their bedroom door. I saw that the twins were still asleep and I stayed by the bedroom door and listened. Things were silent for a minute and then I heard noises again coming from the master bedroom. Then I heard footsteps leaving the bedroom and getting closer. They walked down the hall to seemingly go downstairs. I hoped this meant whoever was in the house was leaving and I decided to call the police. I felt comfortable actually speaking now that the person was downstairs and I dialed 911 and told them what was going on. They said an officer would be out there shortly, I hoped, and was sort of expecting whoever was in the house to leave. And I listened close to hear the sound of the front door opening or closing as I waited, though, I didn't hear it. Instead, I heard footsteps coming back up the stairs. Again, my heart started to beat faster and faster. The footsteps were slowly getting closer. Then they arrived just outside the bedroom door that I was in. I held my breath and closed my eyes. Whoever was on the other side of the door then tried opening it. The doorknob turned but stopped. Then I heard footsteps walking back into the master bedroom that was next door. Again, I was still standing there, trying not to make any kind of sounds at all. Whoever was there stayed in the master bedroom for maybe 30 seconds if I had to guess. Then they came back out into the hallway and stood right outside the bedroom that I was in. I felt like they knew I was in there. Still, 
I tried my best to be quiet and not make a sound. Then I heard the sound of sirens. They were coming from down the street and were very quickly getting louder and louder. I heard the footsteps now moving away and go back downstairs. The police were there and in the house within a minute, to my surprise, they caught the intruder, which happened to be a man that lived nearby. I guess it ended up being a long night, but everything turned out fine. I was just happy that the twins and I were okay. When I was a little bit younger, I used to babysit. I did it for about a year and a half total and this happened back in 2017 when I was 18 years old. I would mostly babysit for family, friends and people that knew my family well. It wasn't something that I would really go out of my way to do that much, but I enjoyed it for the most part and it was pretty easy money generally. One day I happened to go to one of the local grocery stores. On my way home after the gym, a man approached me inside who I didn't know, but he said hey, aren't you Ariel? That is in fact my name. And the man then said he was good friends with the Johnsons. The Johnsons were a family that I would occasionally babysit for and they were family friends of mine. I told him yes and the man told me that he was just about to call me because he really needed a babysitter for tonight. The man said his name was Mike and he was average height, had light brown hair and wore a vest jacket. He apologized for the short notice. But said that his normal babysitter had cancelled and he had heard about me when asking around. I was free that night and didn't have any plans yet but I had an unsure feeling, probably because I had just met this man, but if he knew the Johnsons, I guess it was all right. He then told me how much he would pay and said that his son was five years old, old and pretty well behaved. I thought for a second and then agreed to babysit his son that night. I'm not going to lie. The main reason I accepted it was after finding out how much he was going to pay, he gave me the address and told me to be there at 8 p.m. That night, when the time came, I drove to his house. It was about 20 minutes away and when I got to the neighborhood it looked pretty rough. The house was run down looking. I parked on the side of the street in front and texted Mike that I was at his house. He replied saying great, come on in. With an exclamation point I walked up the driveway, which did not have a car in it. At all. I went to the front door, but it was locked, so I texted Mike again. He replied almost immediately saying that he was sorry and he had forgotten to mention to tell me to go in the side door. Then he told me to go down into the basement to meet his son. I walked around to the side door and opened it. When I got inside the house, it looked almost as bad as the outside. There wasn't much inside, but the things that were appeared to be in really bad shape. There was garbage on the floor, an old beat up table and dirty shag carpeting in the living room. The only lights were from a couple of dim lamps. I saw the basement doors open with the stairs leading down. And I saw that the basement appeared to be unfinished. I was getting a really bad feeling about this whole situation. Meanwhile, I was just standing inside the house in front of the basement door for about a minute. Then I felt my phone vibrate as if I was receiving another text. I pulled it out of my pocket and looked at it. It was another text from Mike. He said, what are you waiting for? Come downstairs already. I didn't respond. I just kept standing there. For some reason, I had a strong urge to just leave the house. I felt like going into the basement would be a really bad idea. I was trying to decide if I was just being scared for no reason or if I was actually doing the right thing. If Mike's son's bedroom was down there and Mike was downstairs with him, then everything should be fine. But also, why would his bedroom be in an unfinished basement? And why couldn't he meet me upstairs? In these few seconds, I got another text. It said, come downstairs. I don't have all night to wait for you. Going against my instincts, I took a few steps and then began to walk down the stairs. I got another text as I was doing so. It said, hurry, in all caps. This was just too much. I had a terrible feeling about going down there, and it was getting worse the farther I went. Something was off about Mike for sure. I turned around and walked back up the stairs. When I reached the top, I heard footsteps from the basement, and it sounded like they were starting to go up the stairs. 
I walked right back to the door and went outside, closing the door behind me. Once I was completely outside, I sprinted for my car and drove all the way home. I made it home, and once inside, I told my parents that I didn't end up taking the babysitting job after all. After that, I finally looked at my phone again. I had several more texts from Mike. One said, you shouldn't have left. The next one said, that's right, I don't even have a kid. Then he said, my name's not even Mike, and I don't live in that house, so don't even try reporting me. I got the chills when reading this. I think there was definitely something wrong with that guy. To think about how close I came to entering his basement just knowing I was in his house really creeps me out. I ended up telling my parents all about it. And then we went to the police. It turns out my parents' friends, the Johnsons, did know who the guy was, but they weren't really friends with him. He just used to be their neighbor. For a short time. With all the information we did have, he ended up getting caught. What I still don't know is how he found me in the first place. This story takes place five years ago as I was babysitting for my cousin's kids. My cousin and her husband have two kids at the time. Their son Asher was seven and their daughter Alyssa was five. They're both really well behaved and always have been. I always loved babysitting them because we got along great and I knew it would be an easy night. Usually I would hang out with the kids for a bit make them dinner, and they would usually do their own thing for a bit before bedtime. Their bedtime was 9 p.m., and after they went to bed, I would just hang out in the living room and watch TV or something. The house was pretty nice, and I think I babysat them about 10 times total. One night, it was a Friday, and after I arrived, I made dinner for the kids, and things were going very smooth. We all watched a movie after that, and then it was bedtime. Alyssa went to bed first, and Asher didn't seem as tired. But by 9 o'clock, he too had gotten ready for bed, and I said goodnight to him. After that, I would have maybe an hour or two before they would get home. I texted some friends on my phone and then was deciding what to put on the TV when I saw Asher walking towards me from the hallway. I asked him what he was doing back up, and he told me that he was scared because he had just seen a man walk past his window. Asher's bedroom faced the backyard of the house, which was fenced off, and this neighborhood was relatively private, so obviously this raised some concerns. I asked Asher what the man looked like and if he was sure he saw a man. He was not known to make things up like this, so I believed him. I just wanted to be sure. He said that the man just looked average and he couldn't see him that well. I asked him which direction the man was going, and he pointed to the opposite end of the house. We both went into his bedroom and looked out the window. All I saw was the quiet, dark backyard. I told Asher that he should go back to bed, but if he saw the man again, to let me know. And I assured him that I would keep an eye on the backyard from the living room window. Then he went back to bed, and I returned to the living room. The living room did have a pretty good view of the backyard, although I couldn't see all of it. About 20 minutes went by and I would frequently look out to the backyard. One time I looked over and actually did see somebody out there. There was a guy walking by the window near the back of the house where the kitchen is. I couldn't believe it. It was pretty dark out there, but there was no mistaking it. I really didn't expect the guy to come back. I walked over to the window and looked outside. The man was now out of sight. He must have gone around to the side of the house. I thought about what I should do. I considered calling the police or calling my cousin and explaining what was going on. But ultimately I decided not to. I didn't want to have my cousin get worried or cause a scene, but I did plan on mentioning it to them when they returned home. I figured that the man would leave, or at least that's what I was hoping. Some time passed by and I kept watching out the backyard. The man didn't return for a good 15 minutes or so. Then. As I was still in the living room, I heard the doorbell ring. Who would this be? I left the living room and walked to the front of the house and opened the front door. As soon as I did, I saw the same man standing there on the front step. I wasn't expecting this at all. The man said that his car had just broken down and his phone was dead and he was wondering if he could come inside the house and make a quick call. 
I wasn't going to fall for this, and I told the man no. I didn't bother asking him why he had been walking in the backyard. The man just said once again, can I please come inside for just a second? I got really nervous and just blurted out to the guy that the police were on the way. Then I slammed the door in his face and locked it. I was kind of surprised at myself for this, but looking back, I'm glad I did it. The guy backed up from the front step and then walked away into the street. Of course, I was afraid that the man was going to come back yet again. And I kept watching out all of the windows of the house. Not too long later, though, I would guess maybe 20 minutes, my cousin and her husband got home. I was relieved for them to be home and told them everything. They did end up calling the police, so I had to stay there for a while longer to answer some questions. Then I was able to go home. My cousin told me since then they haven't seen the man at all or anything else suspicious, which I'm glad to hear. I still wonder, though, who he was and what he really wanted.